Uh, you have all the background most hard science fiction writers only dream of, yet your books are written with obvious emphasis on style and characterization. Why is this your focus and not the science? Well, I tend to believe that you should play all your suits if you're uh, going to be an earnest writer. Uh, you should deal with both style uh, and uh, content and background and characterization and everything. I certainly include a large dollop of science in my work, I think, and I try to blend this together with the kind of people who do science. That's my real interest, is this impact of science on people and the other way around. Do you think that uh, mainstream and science fiction are separate categories? Or, uh, well, I guess they are now, but do you think they should be melded, or do you think they should keep this uh, separate identity? I think that mainstream and any genre like SF are, in a sense, uh, two ends of a spectrum, and one blends into the other. There are obviously the books that only science fiction addicts will read, and which are incomprehensible to ordinary readers, and that defines a boundary. But obviously it's a gradual transition from one to the other. The science is, in science fiction, not the really crucial dividing point. Uh, there are many things in science fiction which set it apart which are not uh, connected with uh, knowing a great deal of science, but rather with knowing a lot of accepted bits of jargon or um, common places we've assumed about the future, uh, the way galactic empires are put together and so forth, usually very simple-mindedly in, in my estimation. Uh, and an ordinary reader coming to these things simply cannot understand them, and therefore he rather usually quickly gives up. But, but therefore I, I think that it's the mannerisms of SF that tend to set it apart as much as anything else. Of course, science fiction is concerned with content a great deal more than other literature, uh, and therefore that scares off people too. Do you read a great deal of science fiction or mainstream, or have a preference for one or the other? I read, when I can, the best science fiction and the best in the mainstream. And also, for example, uh, hard-boiled detective stories and a lot of other things. Now, I keep up on the prominent short story writers in, a, in America, for example. So I try to read eclectically. But, of course, everyone, as they get older, has less time to read, particularly if they're actually engaged in the real world and have some other job other than being a writer. Do these other works influence your style continually, or uh, do you think you've got that set now? I don't really think that I've got a style. I, I certainly have some identifiable mannerisms. But it seems to me that every one of my books is written somewhat differently. And I do change uh, style and approach fairly often. Uh, I may be wrong about that. Many people may think that there is a noticeable Benford style. But I don't think that I pick up those things from my reading directly, although certainly I'm influenced by a lot of writers. Every writer is influenced by people who came before, otherwise we'd have to invent literature whole uh, each time we sat down to do a novel. Your novel, Timescape, just won the Nebula Award, which congratulations, by the way. Um, how did you come to write that? I took ten years to write Timescape. It's written out of my experience as a graduate student at the University of California in the 1960s. Two-thirds of the book occurs in 1962 and 63. And I had always noticed that science fiction very seldom dealt with the life of a scientist as it is really lived as I saw it. So when I began to think about writing a book about time, a subject that had already and always fascinated me, in which science fiction had, it seemed to me, done to death, I began, in fact, to think about the way scientists would really try to attempt to transmit information across time. Not time travel, but simple time telegrams, if you will. And how would it happen? What would make people do it? How would it be received? What would scientists think about it? Because, you see, the basic ingredient in the novel 
is to treat time communication like a new paradigm in science so that you have scientists confronting something that's very unusual that they can't explain that seems to not fit the standard way of doing science. After all, here's an experiment that's being interfered with and seems to be carrying a message. How bizarre. Um, and so this is like a scientist encountering a brand new scientific idea. So you get to see in a dramatic fashion how scientists deal with ambiguity and uh, the unusual nature of their work, which does crop up now and then, after all. That's what scientific revolutions are about. And at the same time, the reader can understand what's going on. It's not an arcane matter about uh, genetics or a nuclear physics that's going on. He knows more than any of the characters all the way through the book. And that was what made me think of this as a, as a scheme to show readers things about scientists that just couldn't be told in the normal way, in the sort of the world of the, say, the, uh, a la Watson's The Double Helix and so forth, which is about a specific experiment in the past. So that was the motivation. Um, and as you can see, it's sort of a barely science fictional motivation. I really wanted to talk about both the 60s and 1998, where the message is sent from, but mostly from the point of view of uh, us right here and right now, 1981. I deliberately made the dates of the book fit so that the book was published in hardback in 1980, exactly halfway between the two times that are the subject of the book. And uh, that in the context of making comments on political matters and, and of being able to show a scene from the 1970s that's very different from our 1970s, all of those things made me want to write the book. It then took a mere decade to actually write it. <laughs> you made the novel real to me and to other readers whom I've talked to with the little details, the songs on the radio in the 60s and the current events, the 35-cent paperback, which was hard to believe, um, and then how the people were coping with the future. Um, the thing that really intrigued me was the mercury hunt in the sewers in England. Uh, this technique of putting in the uh, little uh, realistic... Uh, scenarios to portray the future and the past is something that I haven't encountered all that much. Uh, how did you develop that? Well, that really comes out of thinking very hard for a decade about the matter. Uh, every once in a while it would occur to me, uh, in the case of the 1998 world, to think about what ordinary activities they would have that would seem strange to us. And, and as the years went on, I, I would think of these things and jot them down and then I would try to write a scene about them and to involve a character in them. Um, I think this method is just living in the world you're writing about for a long time until it gets to be second nature and you can select from it things you want to show the readers. Uh, there are whole chapters of Timescape which I wrote and reflect on both, both the present and the past and finally excluded from the novel feeling that they weren't really necessary, but there are the whole facets of the world I worked out and then didn't use. Of course, doing the 1960s was, was straight, realistic writing. I simply did a point-for-point -point detailed narrative set in a world that I knew and had lived through and could remember, I was, I was surprised, in enormous detail. I could remember the newspaper headlines, the incidents, uh, the, who was fighting who for the heavyweight championship, the whole thing. Um, and of course, those are just the approaches of the realistic novelist. So that's what I, I used. And I think the big help was that I did not think of it as being a science fiction novel. And that may be why it doesn't feel like a science fiction novel. And in a way, I think it isn't a science fiction novel. A lot of uh, real life people inhabited Timescape. Uh, most of them were in the past, but some of them were in the future. I noticed that uh, Davies and Thorne were in the future. And even Freeman Dyson had an active uh, part in the book. He, he did some talking and kind of got the hero in trouble. Uh, do you know most of these people, and do you need their permission to uh, put them in a book? And did they get a kick out of it? Well, the people who actually have walk-on speaking parts, who are identified as real people, I got the permission from uh, Freeman Dyson particularly. People who are mentioned in passing, I didn't ask their permission because, after all, they are people in the world and you can refer to them. No one has a copyright on his name. Uh, 
but uh, so far no one has objected to being mentioned to mentioned or even uh, talked about in detail in the book. Uh, Dyson uh, certainly didn't mind, and I don't think any of the disguised characters have said anything about it either. There are some relatively well-known scientists. Uh, in the book, who are, I would say, rather thinly concealed, but concealed nonetheless. It, that, for me, was one of the good things about the book, is being able to use my experience and all the people whom I knew, and being able to talk about them the way they, they are, more or less. Not always complimentary, but that's life, isn't it? <laughs> I'd say you uh, knew the twins from Oklahoma quite well, from what I gather. Yes, well... There are some twins from Oklahoma who are not named in there, who uh, are, are in, so, in fact, uh, myself and my twin brother. I had just come from the University of Oklahoma uh, to La Jolla in 1963 and uh, decided, what the hell, I'll just put myself in the book. In fact, I appear in the book in several different places. Have you gotten any feedback from people that normally read mainstream novels about Timescape? saying, oh, gee, this is science fiction, it can't be good, but it was, or something like that? Well, yes, I've gotten a fair number of letters and phone calls and so on from people who, quote, don't usually read science fiction, unquote, and are surprised to find that, that science fiction can actually have all the, the virtues of a regular novel and still be science fiction. Um, well, it's good that these people are catching on to that fact. Admittedly, the field has not given them a large number of examples to learn from, uh, but I hope uh, we will in future. But of course, the reason we haven't produced such books before is because it's damned hard. It's a lot of work. And uh, science fiction is typically not a field in which re rewards taking a decade to write a book. That's a sad fact, but it's true. Did you ever fear during these 10 years that this book might not be a commercial success because of the subject matter and the, the emphasis on characterization and so forth? Definitely. But I decided well, what the hell I was going to write the book the way I wanted to, and I didn't care how it would do. In fact, when I finished the manuscript, I was pretty convinced that what I would be able to sell it for only a minimal advance, and that would be just about it. The overwhelming success, as far as I'm concerned, of, of this book. Uh, it's now won four awards, uh, the, I should say the Nebula, the British Award, the Australian, and now the, the, the John W. Campbell International Award. Uh, it, and to have uh, sold so well in hardback, and now it's, 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 it's in its second printing in paperback after having been out for less than four weeks, uh, that kind of reception is, to me, astounding, uh, completely unanticipated. I personally thought it was by far the best piece of writing I'd ever done, but that doesn't mean I thought it was going to be commercial. In fact, I didn't. <laughs> Your earlier work books had elements of mysticism and transcendental experiences in them, which were missing from Timescape. Um, is this a facet of your personality, uh, this uh, enamor with uh, mysticism? Well, yes, I, I tend to put material like that in my books because I think it's there in the sense that it's, there is a mystical content in science. Um, so many people have commented on it, I have a feeling maybe I ought to let it go for a while. Uh, of course, it's not really true that uh, Timescape doesn't have elements of mysticism in it. There is The last long chapter can certainly be interpreted in a number of different ways, and there are some very, very, shall we say, transcendental moments in that uh, last portion of the book. But certainly... Uh, the emphasis is much less than in, in my early work. You're right about that. Do you think uh, being a, so well acquainted with quantum physics uh, puts you in a special position uh, to look at uh, mystical and transcendental experiences, or uh, would you th have it anyway? Well, that's a kind of a chicken and egg question. Now, one of the reasons I became interested in quantum mechanics was because it seemed to me to be a very fundamental, uh, transcendental way of viewing the world. And therefore, I tend to use material like that in my books if I wish to look at things from that angle. So, to me, it's just another facet of the world that seems to reward being looked at from a transcendental point of view. I'm mostly, however, a rather realistic novelist. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really... I don't think of myself as being a mystical writer. Maybe others do. It's an 
interesting thing if it's true. <laughs> Larry Niven has said that any time travel story is perforce a fantasy uh, since the known laws of physics prohibit it. Uh, as a physicist, do you foresee any loopholes uh, that might allow time travel or time communication or faster than light uh, travel, which this would all tie together? Well, yes. Of course, the timescape at its basis says, suppose there is this particle called a tachyon, which travels faster than light. The tachyon has been talked about in the scientific literature for about 20 years, and hundreds of papers have been written about it. I've written one myself. So if the tachyon exists, it certainly implies faster than light, and therefore reversed time communication. Uh, that's the whole point about timescape. It's about, it's, it's set in a world in which you say, suppose this is true. As far as time travel goes, I don't have the slightest clue how to do it. Maybe turn somebody into tachyons and shoot him backward in time. I, it's hard to see how you could do it. After all, we can't transport someone spatially now just with waves, can we? We can't teleport. Um, so I think, in the sense that Niven meant it, yes, time travel is a fantasy in the strict sense that science doesn't tell us how to do it. But the seduction of time travel stories is the great feeling of perspective they give you. And being able to contrast past and present and future so easily. So I think that those stories are going to go on for a very long time. Everyone loves them. Um, and I do too. They have produced, uh, that area has produced some of the best SF ever, ever written. So uh, I really think it makes sense to contender, continue the convention in the face of quite well-founded scientific objections. You rewrote Deeper Than the Darkness as the stars in Shroud, and I understand that you perhaps may go back and reduce some other old works. Why do you choose to rewrite the old books rather than uh, put all your energy into something new? Basically because I didn't want the old works to appear with my name on them when I could see that they were so deeply flawed, and I thought I could do a better job. I don't think I'm going to do that with any more of my books, but I have certainly greatly revised uh, a, a novel of mine, I sort of a homage to the Heinlein Juvenile, called uh, Jupiter Project. I revised that when it went into paperback, and I did that, as you said, with The Stars and Shroud. Basically, I don't like to have less than my best in front of the public, and I care more about craftsmanship than I do about storing up my energies for the next project. Uh, I would prefer to salvage an old work than hammer away at a new one if I could be contented that at least I had, had never done anything I thought was really dreadful and allowed it to go out in public. A, a lot of writers don't feel this. And I understand, particularly economically, uh, why they would believe so. But I don't have to write for money. Uh, writing is a hobby for me, so I can do it as I like, thank God. How do you juggle writing of the obvious caliber that you practice it with um, the pretty full-time role of being a physics professor? Well, I spend most of my time doing research and a lot of, of time teaching, of course, and then I have maybe 10, 15 percent of my time left over uh, for writing. It's not really left over because it's my weekends and evenings. How do I do it? Sometimes I wonder. The best answer is hurriedly. <laughs> but in fact, I do work on my prose a great deal. I do many drafts of everything. I recently acquired a word processor to make this process simpler. But fundamentally, uh, long ago, I decided to practice uh, time conservation wherever possible. And the, the first rule of that is never do anything twice unless you enjoy it. So I try to never, uh, say, have to redraft simple things like memos, and always am very selective about what I do with my time. Other than that, I just have to say I, uh, I draw a lot of my material that I write about from life from observing people and so on. So I'm really doing two things at once. When I go to a scientific conference, I'm sopping up the material, uh, but I'm also sopping up scientists, uh, watching the way people actually act. And uh, 
every novelist does that. It's just that most novelists are full-time writers, and therefore they don't get out and see the real world very much. I think that's the great liability of being a professional writer who only does that, is that you run out of material. And I, I think the 20th century is full of writers whose big problem is that they ran out of material. Let me go back now and ask you uh, the first question on the list, since it looks like we have time. Give us a bit of background how you got into writing science fiction. Well, I was in graduate school in La Jolla in 1964. I was working very hard, and I really needed a break. But just going to the beach didn't seem to, uh, to do it. So I began to write short stories. It was a pleasant thing you could do for an hour in the evening before you fell asleep. And I worked away at that, wrote some detective stories, which I never sold, then wrote some science fiction short stories, uh, two or three, I think. No, the, the third one, I think, uh, yes, was the one I sold, uh, the first one I sold. And I entered it, and in fact, specifically wrote it for a short story contest in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And it won second place. And, uh, let's see, what did I make? Something like $100, and, uh, and I got a lifetime subscription to the magazine, which has turned out to be worth quite a bit. So, back there in 1965, I started out my career that way, and kept writing short stories as I did my doctorate and went off and became a, a postdoctoral fellow, and then began to think in terms of writing a novel. And it took me, I would say, really the better part of a decade to learn to write novels with anything approaching skill. It's, it's a long haul. I've been writing now for, what, 16 years? Or 17 years, I guess. Maybe more. Uh, uh, and I wrote, in fact, when I was in high school. I wrote a few short stories and then gave it up. So I, I just had writing as a, as a hobby all the way through my life. How did your, when you first joined the physics departments, um, how do your colleagues take it uh, before you have tenure, when you're just green behind the ears, that sort of thing, uh, knowing that you're a writer? Uh, do they they even know it or uh, dig you about it or just don't care or what? All of the above. Uh, <laughs> they, some of them just ignore it. Some of them think it's uh, outright evidence that you're not really earnestly spending all of your time and 24 hours a day on your profession, which they more or less expect you to do. And a number of them think it's a good idea that you should have uh, more than one suit in your hand. Um, so uh, the, it, it runs through the, the whole gamut of opinion. There are a lot of academics who think that writing is okay. And if I were writing little short stories for literary quarterlies, it would be perfectly okay and just fine. But if I actually write commercially, that's not so good. And to write commercially and be successful, that's even worse. And to write science fiction and be commercially successful is really pretty low. So uh, there are a fair number of those people but I just ignore them. Uh, they cannot be converted, nor can they be educated. Uh, they'd best be forgotten. Well, we noticed that you, you now have, uh, you're now a full professor, so uh, you really don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> well, that's, that's true. I've never really worried about it anyway. I really don't give that much of a damn what people think about my writing in terms of uh, what they, if they evaluate it on the basis of some kind of preconceived status they wish to assign to it. I think being an approved writer in this society is one of the sh almost sure signs uh, that you are a second rate. That is the end of the list. Okay. And uh, we sure appreciate it. And um, again, we'll get back to you and uh, perhaps do another one one of these days when your other books come out. We look forward to them. Fine. I, uh, I'd like to I appreciate the opportunity. It's, it's really nice to be able to speak specifically to a, an SF audience. Seldom gets the chance. Thanks again. We'll talk to you later then. Thank you. You bet. Bye-bye then. Bye.